Well, good morning, everyone. Guy, I hope with all the chatting, the singing is going to lift the roof this morning, really. <laughs> it's just lovely to come into a church and hear everybody talking. You know, it's such a lovely atmosphere of fellowship. And we just give you a, a really warm welcome on this very beautiful and fresh summer's day. Isn't it a gorgeous day today after the humidity of the wink? Really, really lovely. And we pray that for those of us here and, and those of you at home on Zoom, that uh, we will feel and know very deeply the presence and the peace of God with us today. Peter and Shauna are on vacation. They are in the process of moving house, so we'll be rem remembering them in our prayers too. Um, but obviously, as you go from here, continue to remember them. It's a very busy time for them, as we all know, with moving houses. Um, but we do pray that in the midst of moving and settling, they will also have a time of rest and of refreshment as well. So we do pray and remember them. So as we come to our worship, we have a call to worship this morning, which will be up on the screen. And these are some words for, from Psalm 136, and we'll read it responsively. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you have brought each of us safely to this place. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and praise. As we gather, we remember those who were not with us today. For those who were sick, we ask for healing. And for those who are away from us, we ask for your blessing to be upon them. And we do especially remember Pastor Peter and Shauna on their vacation. And as they are settling into a new home, may they have a very special sense of your presence and your peace and your strength. We invite your beautiful Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Come dwell in each of our hearts. Equip us, challenge us, comfort us, teach us, inspire us as we learn more about your majestic ways. Father, as we meet now, may we behold your beauty and encounter your grace. We ask all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Come through the fiercest droughts and storms What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love. By the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live.
body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead free in one. Father, Spirit and Son, the Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great!
Please be seated. heads in prayer. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace where fears are stilled, where strivings cease. My comforter, 
my all in all. Here, in the love of Christ, I stand. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art. Our loving Heavenly Father, we have sung such wondrous words of worship and truth and praise. And we thank you that we can meet in this place and offer you our worship and just lift up our hearts and our voices. And with all the windows open, we just pray that the message of the voices that we are singing will just uh, reach the ears of those who are walking by the church this morning. That Lord, they will know that you are their hope and that you are a good and faithful God. Lord, as we come now to bring you our tithes and our offerings, this is all a part of our worship, all a part of what we give you. Lord, we pray that that message of hope and steadfast love will reach abroad, Lord, into our families, into our community, and indeed, Lord, across this world where this message is so greatly needed. Father, take our gifts and use them for your glory and your honour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we take up our tithes and offerings, we ask our ushers to come forward. We're just going to sing this beautiful song, Hide Me Now Under Your Wings. Well, the service that Chris and I are leading you in this morning is one that we led Camp Berbalak in on the long weekend in July. And it was beautiful. We were outside uh, in this um, covered picnic area. And uh, when Peter needed someone to cover for him while he was away, we said, yeah, we're willing to do it. We're going to bring the service that we did at Camp Berbalak. So that's why we have lots of singing because the, the campers love to sing. And we also do always have a children's moment up there. So we're going to have a children's moment this morning, but we're going to call it a congregational moment because we have Jojo here 
And Jojo, you've been amazing this morning already with us. But I wonder if you want to come to the front with your grandma, because I've got some friends that are going to help me uh, give this children moment today. So I'm going to turn this off. Whoops, I'll try not to trip over on the way. <laughs> that would be bad. Hey, Jojo, come and sit down here with Grandma. Now, I'm going to kind of sit and stand, because if I sit, I don't know if you can, can you see me if I sit? Kind of wiggle a bit. Well, I'm going to sit and hold things up and maybe stand around a bit. Is that all right? Now, I have some friends with me that I love very dearly. And I think you might know them too. And I think a lot of people here are going to know them. So who's this? Is this Pig Piglet? Who's this, everybody? Piglet. And who do we love Piglet? Yeah, of course we do. Piglet is going to help us tell the story this morning. So we're just going to sit Piglet on the chair here. And uh, who is this? he's mine piglet is my granddaughter's piglet is roses and she's i had to leave her a message because i had to borrow it and it was a cuddly at the end of her bunk bed and um, i had to leave her a message to say thank you for letting me borrow piglet and i have another friend in here of hers and i promise that i will look after them so i've looked after piglet because he is lovely but eeyore is my eeyore and he is cuddly and and look even to stop him losing his tail in one of the stories with his bow on. So I have a story, and it's a very short story found in one of A.A. A. Milne's stories, and it's called Violets for Eeyore. Now, do you know what a violet is, Jojo? Have you seen a violet in the garden before? It's a flower. Yeah, do we know what violets are? We find them in the garden in the spring, and, and I have clumps of them, and they're a beautiful purpley color. Now, because it's violets, I couldn't, uh, because it's summer, I couldn't bring any violets in, but I brought these in because these are a similar color to violets, and these are called sweet peas. And are you allergic to pollen? Can you sniff them? Because they smell beautiful. Do you want to have a sniff? Can you smell them? And this is the first year I've grown sweet peas in my garden from seed. And I'm really, really happy with them. My mother-in-law had little boat bunches of this all around the garden. And I remember around the house and when I was very first dating Chris, I just remember that really clearly. So I want to do the same as my mother-in-law and put sweet peas around the house. But I thought I would bring these in today. So... This is a very short story, part of a bigger story, and I'm reading it out of a much loved, was once a hardback book, all the tales of Winnie the Pooh that belong to Sam and Rosie, and they've let me borrow this. So Piglet had got up early that morning to pick himself a bunch of violets. And when he had picked them and put them in a pot in the middle of his house, it suddenly came over him that nobody had ever picked Eeyore a bunch of violets. And the more he thought about this, the more he thought how sad it was to be an animal who had never had a bunch of violets picked for him. So he hurried out again. We all know how Piglet hurries and scurries everywhere, saying to himself, Eeyore violets. And then Violet's Eeyore, in case he forgot, because it was that sort of day. And he picked a large bunch and trotted along smelling them and feeling very happy until he came to the place where Eeyore was. Now I'm going to finish the story there. Is Eeyore a happy donkey? Is he happy? No, he's not really. He's a gloomy donkey. He's known to be gloomy, isn't he? Well, in the rest of the story, we find out that Eeyore was not only gloomy, he was downright grumpy. He was grumpy with Piglet and he was grumpy with Rabbit. But even so, a lovely Piglet who has a heart of gold gave Eeyore that bunch of violets. 
Now, do you think that might have put a slight smile on Eeyore's grumpy face? Do you think? What do you think? I think Eeyore might have liked the violets, do you? You know, to brighten up his little house a bit, I think. Well, I hope so, Randy, too. Totally, the story doesn't actually tell us that, but I jolly hope so. So that Piglet might get him even some more violets. Absolutely. Violets and flowers are lovely. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, do you know, wasn't it a really kind thing that Piglet did when he was out doing those things for himself, picking those lovely violets to cheer up his own home? He thought about gloomy, sad Eeyore and how lovely it would be if Eeyore could have a bunch of violets. And so Piglet did a very, very kind thing. And kindness is something that's really important in all of our lives. Now, I was going to ask the children and Jojo and all of you, how can we can be kind? But I just want to let you know that Jojo this morning has been with Elaine helping her greet. She's been with Jo in the kitchen. Were you doing the washing up in the kitchen with Jo? And she's been helping Elaine, her grandma, take up the offering. So she is a beautiful, kind little girl. And we're very thankful to you, Jojo, for all the kindness that you show to us here when you come on a Sunday morning. Because she does this every Sunday morning. And there's all different ways to be kind. How else can we be kind? Throwing it out there. Anybody, how else can we be kind? Send a note. Yes, we can exactly send a note. Give hugs. Totally, we can give hugs. Love all different ways. Sam and Rosie cook um, muffins with their mum and take it to a neighbour. Being kind. All the smallest ways, isn't it? It's so important that we do that. And there's a verse in the Bible. I'm just going to put that down here. From Proverbs that a very wise man called King Solomon wrote. And he said, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy to the body. Now, who likes honey? I like honey. Delicious. And where do we put honey? Where do you put your honey? On toast. On toast. In a honey sandwich. Drizzle it on ice cream, perhaps. I don't know, maybe on a pancake. When you've got a cold, have a lemon and honey in your tea or a hot drink, all good. Honey makes you feel yummy and lovely, doesn't it? When you eat honey, it's, it sets you up for the day. Honey is delicious. And so what the Bible is saying is when we speak kind words, the person that hears them, to them they sound sweet like honey. They make you feel better. Maybe you're feeling a bit down and they make you feel happy. They make you feel a bit more cheerful. So kind words are really important. Now, I thought we could learn a bit of that word. This is where we, I'm going to stand up here because we're all going to do this. We're going to learn a very short version of that verse. We're going to simply learn kind words are like honey. We're going to use our hands. All right, so the, um, the sign for kind is you put your hand up and your finger out. And you put it over your heart and you draw a circle. Yeah, so like this and over your heart. Can you see, everyone see? So we're going to do that and just say the word kind. We say kind. Lovely. Now the sign for words, is you put your finger up like this and make this with it. Okay, and then you just tap so you go words. Okay, words. So let's put those two together, shall we? We say kind words are like, then this is a really honey, you tap the side of your cheek with your middle finger and then put your palm on your, on your cheek. Honey, we do that together and say honey, honey. So we put that all together and we have kind words are like honey. Brilliant, well done. Now we're not gonna forget that, are we? <laughs> I'll test you next week. And I thought that was really interesting when I looked up the sign language for honey, and it was this. 
It's on your cheek. And what's your cheek part of? But your mouth. And where do we speak kind words from? Your mouth. And I just thought that was a really interesting connection. Honey, the words on your cheek. Now, which of um, Piglet's and Eeyore's friends likes honey? Who likes honey? Pooh Bear. Pooh Bear. So this is a Rose's other look. Isn't he lovely? Pooh Bear with his honey pot. And I have to take very good care of Pooh Bear too. Now, who chases Pooh Bear when he's after their honey? Tigger. Oh, what about the buzzy things? Bees. Bees. What about bees when he tries to get the honey down from the tree and the bees chasing? Because bees make the honey. So when we see a bee, and when we eat, and of course we must never go near bees because they sting. And it's because they're really busy collecting all the nectar to make the honey, or the bumblebees are busy collecting pollen to pollinate all the plants. So we don't want to go near them, but we can watch them because they're fascinating to watch. But when we see a bee, and when we eat the yummy honey, let's always remember to be kind. So let's have a prayer, shall we? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the simple stories of A.A. A. Milne and Winnie the Pooh and the tremendous life lessons that are actually all within his books. We thank you for the simple story of Violets for Eeyore and how important it is for us and for children and us to teach our children and even for the children to teach us as adults to be kind to one another. Lord, we thank you for Jojo and for how kind she is to us. And we just pray for her in her life that she would know how much you love her and that you are with her through all of her life in every step that she takes. Bless her and all the family, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So as you probably gathered, I love Winnie the Pooh. I loved reading it as a child and I loved reading A.A. A. Milne's children's books of poems. He wrote When We Are Six, or When We Are Six and When We Were Very Young. And I have those original books I had as a little girl at home and I just loved them and loved them. And we thoroughly enjoy reading those stories to our children and now of course to our grandchildren. Such lovely stories. But I think as adults sometimes when we read them again, we actually discover more of the, of the richness of the simplicity of those small life lessons that A.A. A. Milne th thread and wove through all those stories. And they make you laugh too, don't they? They're such fun. Well, we're going to take a closer look this morning at the characteristic of kindness. And just as an introduction, I want to share just some things with you of our experience of kindness. And uh, every summer, we've been here for 21, 22, 22 years. And so when our family came to visit from England during the summer, we made it a tradition, Chris and I, that we would take them all out for breakfast. And we would go up to the main street landing in Buckhorn. And I don't know if any of you have been there and sat out on the patio and we would sit there on a big long table and we would watch the boats go by the lock with our plates of bacon and eggs and sausage and home fries and toast and coffee and it makes you drool thinking about it because it's always and I love bacon and egg it's one of my favorite things. And this particular year it was uh, our sister and brother-in-law came with our niece and nephew and my mum and dad. And we were all sitting, enjoying ourselves together on that first morning they were with us. And Chris went to pay the, the bill and he came back and said, it's already been settled. Someone had watched us as a family and on their way out, they had bought us breakfast. They said, you're just enjoying yourself so much as a family. We wanted to do that. That was the message they gave to the lady. We have no idea who they were because they'd left. 
So we had no way of saying thank you. But we were entirely overwhelmed by that kindness. It was so unexpected and such a blessing and an amazing start to a very special holiday time together. That was the kindness of a stranger. A few years ago, quite a while ago now, I was very sick and undergoing treatment. And someone who I didn't know at the time from our congregation here came and knocked on our door with a big box. And the box, our children were young at the time, were full of meals already for the family. And then she came over one afternoon and cooked to us a delicious roast beef dinner. The kindness of a, the fellowship of believers and the kindness that she showed, and I didn't know her then at all, was the beginning of an extremely precious and special friendship. Now, every morning our alarm goes off way too early for my liking. Chris is up and off and out. And um, I make my way to the kitchen. I'm extremely bleary eyed. Quite often, I'm not really sure how I get there because I don't think I open my eyes. But when I arrive at the kitchen, I find that there is a hot drink and a bowl with a spoon in it ready for my cereal. Now, I appreciate Chris's kindness completely because that really helps me get going in the morning. And I love him very dearly for helping his crotchety wife out when she gets up in the morning. <laughs> the kindness of family. Aesop, when he lived between five and 600 BC, the Greek philosopher or the Greek storyteller said, no act of kindness, however small, is ever wasted. And Mark Twain, the American author, said, kindness is a language the deaf can hear and the blind can see. The Bible mentions the word kindness over 200 times and the word kind over 400. And so this morning, I'm going to share with you four thoughts at what the Bible tells us about kindness. First of all, we're going to go back into the Old Testament and to the book of Ruth. And I know for those of you that were here last summer, you know I spoke on the book of Ruth. So we're just gonna look at Ruth and Orpah and Naomi for a few minutes. Now the book of Ruth is full of the most deeply theological themes. And yet at the same time, this small book of four chapters is a book that tells us about the kindness of family. Naomi, an Israelite from Bethlehem, went with her husband and two sons to the country of Moab to escape the famine in the town of Bethlehem. But in Moab, as we know, Elimelech and her two sons died, which left Naomi a widow in a foreign land, which meant that she was extremely vulnerable. And so Naomi decides to go home. And Ruth and Orpah, her two daughters-in-law, also widows at this time as well, start making that journey with her. And Naomi turns to them and she prays for them and she says this, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. And that was an incredibly sacrificial and kind prayer. Because Naomi, I'm sure, would have loved the company of her two daughters-in-law. I'm sure she would have loved that more than anything else on her journey and then as she resettled back in Bethlehem. But she knew that for Ruth and Orpah, both from Moab, the best thing for them to do would be to go home, to their mother's home, to all that was familiar to them. And so despite her heartbreak in, in saying goodbye to them, Naomi feels she does the right thing and she lets them go. Now that took sacrifice and that took strength. 
And that was kindness, motivated by love, wanting the best for the loved one. And then she prays for them. And she says this, may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. Ruth and Orpah had been so kind to Naomi and her family that Naomi asked God to show them that same kindness. And when you really think about that, that is a huge testimony to the character and to the lives of these two women. Now, for those of you that know me know I love words. So we're gonna have three words for kindness this morning. And the first word is the Hebrew word that is written here in the book of Ruth chapter one. And that is the Hebrew word hesed. Now hesed is a huge word and has some very deep meanings, which to be honest, we could do three or four messages on in and of itself to look at the word hesed through the Bible. So we're literally scratching the surface of this word. But at the core of this word, are three characteristics and these characteristics always interact with each other and they are strength steadfastness and love hesed is generous it is mutual in relationships and it describes devotion in a marriage and there is repeated reference to god's hesed throughout the Bible, one of his most central characteristics, God's loving kindness. And in Psalm 136, verse one, which we all read together this morning, we read together, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And that word love is translated from the Hebrew word hesed. Naomi asked that the God of loving kindness, who is loving kindness in his very essence and whose kindness endures forever, that he show kindness to Ruth and to Orpah. Strong, steadfast, loving, faithful, generous. Naomi, Ruth and Orpah had been through the most terrible time of loss and grief and sadness. But they show that the kindness of family binds it together through the toughest and most difficult of times. For our second thought, we're gonna jump into the New Testament and we're gonna jump into the book of Acts and chapter 28, where we read about the kindness of strangers. Now, all around this chapter, Paul is being taken as a prisoner to Rome and he's on board a boat and Luke is with him. And they have been caught in a terrible storm for 14 nights. And Luke tells us that the ship ran aground and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. There were 276 people on board and every single one of them made it to land. And Luke writes this, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold it's a very bleak picture isn't it he says it was raining and cold the local maltese people with all these people coming off the beach they didn't see roman soldiers and prisoners or foreigners instead i believe that they saw a people who were frightened traumatized cold wet and hungry. So what did they do? They built them a fire. They welcomed them. They built them a fire to provide warmth and to provide light and upon which 
to cook some food. Exactly what was needed, I think, don't you? If you put yourself, I don't think we can put ourselves in the positions of those that were shipwrecked, but if you think about it, light and warmth was what they needed. And Luke describes it as an act of unusual kindness. This was no obligatory act, but it went above and beyond what any of them imagined might have been offered. So our second word for kindness used here in Acts 28 is the Greek word now. I, am no, I know among you are Greek and Hebrew scholars and I am not a Greek or Hebrew scholar. So if I pronounce something wrong, please forgive me. But the Greek word here that Paul uh, Luke uses is philanthropia. And it describes the love shown to mankind. And it is where our word benevolence comes from. It is, uh, it is the desire to do good, to be kind, and to promote another's happiness. And Luke experienced that outpouring of practical love, that philanthropia, as he sat around the fire on the beach, having survived being shipwrecked and wet and cold. And that extraordinary, unusual kindness that he experienced he wrote about and it ended up in our living word of God and I think that in itself speaks volumes to the message that Luke is telling us here about unusual kindness and when I was speaking with Chris about this as I always do if I'm preparing any form of devotion or a message he said that it reminded him very much of the kindness shown by the people of the East Coast provinces when the airlines during 9-11, the aeroplanes were diverted from American airspace. And all the provinces down the East Coast all had a huge number of airlines and passengers delivered to them. I know Gander is the famous one, we know that very well, but all through the provinces, there were many passengers and, and many airplanes. And so I was reading this. I just thought I would read this to you. This is an account of a Red Cross worker in Nova Scotia. And he speaks like this. 42 international aircraft were diverted to Nova Scotia on 9-11. And I'm sure all of us remember exactly where we were on that terrible day as we watched those events happen. But this is what they write. At about 10 p.m., our group was assigned to open the Dartmouth High School as a reception area for passengers on an Alitalia 747. A team from the phone company installed a phone bank so passengers could call anywhere in the world for free. The military arrived with hundreds of cots and quickly converted the gym into a large dorm. Caterers delivered hot, cold and kosher foods. High school students opened up the computer lab and working with custodians moved big screen TVs into the cafeteria. So when diverted passengers arrived, they could see what had happened. Then residents began showing up, demanding to take home stranded passengers. The passengers weren't there yet, but the Nova Scotians were ready. They told us they cleaned their guest rooms or they'd pulled out the rec room sofa bed. They'd maybe some of them had sent their kids to stay with neighbors or grandparents also that they had room for strangers. Everyone felt it was important that these uninvited guests knew they had a friend. The kindness of strangers, unusual extraordinary kindness how important it is that not only in the biggest events of life but in the very smallest events of life we show unusual kindness to strangers our third thought this morning is from the book of galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 and this describes kindness in the life of believers. Very famous passage that Paul wrote that I'm sure we can all recite together. When Paul said, 
For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And here's an interesting thought. At least I thought it was interesting. Paul didn't write the fruits of the Spirit are as if each one was independent of the other. He wrote the fruit of the Spirit is in the singular. So all of these are aspects of the one fruit that the Spirit of God creates in us. They are evidence in our lives that we are following him and allowing him to mold us more into the likeness of Christ. And this likeness of Christ is to be seen in action among the fellowship of believers, as Paul says in Ephesians, be kind and compassionate to one another. And here is the final Greek word for this morning for kindness that Paul uses here, and that is the word krestos. And it means of being good, gracious, gentle, and kind. It is the grace which pervades the whole nature, mellowing all which would be harsh and austere. It emphasizes the spirit in which an act is done. It is a quality of goodness which requires gentleness in word and in action. And I think we're back to the gentleness like honey, right? And we read about this kindness, don't we, in the early church. We read that the early believers shared what they had with those in need. They cared for the widows among them, and that was a huge ministry. And I think what really, uh, I'm a very visual person, what I can see more than anything is the jailer in Philippi, when he took home Paul and Silas after they had uh, escaped from prison, and he took them home and he bathed their wounds. Now, we can't imagine the state of Paul and Silas, can't we? Thank goodness. But he knew, and he took them home and gently bathed their wounds and his family provided them with a meal. Lydia opened her home, didn't she, to the church, welcomed them in, and I'm sure her words were such kind words of hospitality. And a hundred or so years later, Aristides, a historian in the second century, wrote a letter to the Roman Emperor Hadrian about the early Christians, and in it he said, and this is a quote, and they love one another. And he wrote in his letter about how the Christians conducted themselves and how deeply they cared for others. And it's really interesting if you Google that and read that, how those early Christians in those very early times very, very practically cared for and loved one another. Good, gracious, gentle, and kind. I read an article called The Radical Call of Kindness by Barry Corey, president of Biola Christian University. And he says this, kindness is a biblical way of living. It is not a duty or an act. It is the natural result of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. We exhale kindness after we inhale what's been breathed into us by the Spirit. And I like that, so I'm going to read that again. We exhale kindness. This should be something that's very natural to us. After we inhale what's been breathed into us by the Spirit. Kindness radiates when we're earnest about living the way of Christ, the way of the Spirit. Kindness displays the wonder of Christ's love through us. This is kindness in the life of a believer. And finally, we're going to look at some words from Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul wrote about the kindness of God. He writes, 
these fantastic words. He says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, which really just blows your mind, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The grace offered to us, described as incomparable riches, is given to us from a heart that is kind. We mentioned earlier about the Hesed of God, but I wonder if that has ever settled deeply in our hearts. You know, life is unfair, it's unjust, and it's unkind. But God is utterly kind. His motive, his heart, his actions to save, to heal, to restore, to forgive, to walk beside, and to uphold, all come from a place of kindness, for wanting the best for us and for wanting the best for mankind. And we are receivers of that kindness through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in the life of Christ, we show, we see tremendous kindness. We see the Hesed of God, strength, steadfastness, love, devotion and generosity as he ministered to his family, to his disciples, to his friends and to those around them, talking with them, listening to them, feeding them, healing them, simply being present with them. We see his Christos, his good, gentle, kind heart so many times, but tenderly expressed as he spoke to the woman who threw herself at his feet when she had the issue of blood and touched his cloak. She was full of shame and anguish. And what did he do? But he lifted her up and he called her, my daughter, my daughter, healing her not only in body, but in her heart and restoring her before the people whole and accepted and loved. Such gentleness and sensitivity and tenderness to her. We see his philanthropia, the loving kindness showed towards mankind in his life of service. He had the very nature of a servant, as Paul tells us. He was the servant king. His life of kindness to mankind was sacrificial, costly, brave, that ultimately took him to the cross in order that we may know the kindness of God and have life and hope and joy and peace. Kindness is at the heart of the Christian gospel because kindness is at the heart of God. And a final quote, kindness doesn't pamper and it's not random, it's radical. It's brave and daring, fearless and courageous, and at times kindness is dangerous. It has more power to change people than we can imagine. Kindness as Jesus lived it is at the heart of peacemaking and has the muscle to move mountains. I wonder if any of us have ever thought that kindness is radical. But does the world not need that today? When we look at everything going on and we look at the people around us, does it not need radical kindness? And so where do we start? Sitting here in this beautiful country, in this 
beautiful village of Lakefield on this lovely Sunday morning. Where do we start? We've talked about kindness and Winnie the Pooh and, and Tigger and, and lovely Jojo, but where do we start as adults showing kindness? By showing kindness to our family, to our husbands, to our wives, to our children, to our loved ones. By showing kindness to strangers, unusual, extraordinary kindness. And it totally reminds me of the minister street ministry that Peter leads. By showing kindness among the fellowship of believers, and there is great kindness shown here in this fellowship, I know. But all of it stems from the center of our being where the spirit of God dwells so that in our very nature, we may reflect the loving kindness of God, the Hesed of God to all we meet. After all, John tells us that God is love and Paul, that love is patient and that love is kind. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God, of the gentleness of God, of the steadfastness of God of the kindness of God, of the love of God behind me, before me, underneath me, above me, within me. What assurance there is, what comfort to be taken, what encouragement to be had, our loving God for your kindness that is steadfast and eternal, that your kindness is for us, it is for me. Lord, may we take up the challenge to be kind, to be radically kind, change our hearts into strong, kind places where you dwell, that we may overflow with brave, tender, gracious acts and words of kindness to others, that we may simply reflect your love and draw others to you. Lord, as we bow our hearts and offer you ourselves, so we open our hands and offer you our world, its people, our loved ones, in need of kindness, in need of you. Lord, in the dark, shine your light. In desperation, bring hope. In brokenness, bring comfort. In loneliness, bring love. Our wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, thank you for hearing our prayers that we pray through your precious, wonderful name. Amen. Well, our final hymn this morning that we're going to stand together is simply a hymn of service. Really, it's a hymn where we just commit to each other and it's a hymn where we commit to our families that we are going to be kind we're going to watch out for each other. We're going to walk alongside each other. So let's stand. And we, as we sing this to God, we sing it to each other too. Brother 
on the screen if if people aren't aware of it. Can we have the next slide, Jim? There isn't a slide? Oh, all right, not to worry. We're going to say the grace together, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God be with you in the week ahead. But before you go, going to get you to sit down because it's birthday cake Sunday. Okay? So I expect we're all ready for a cup of coffee and some cake, but we have August birthdays here. So we're just going to read them out. We have Joanne. Jo, our great kitchen leader, is her birthday this week. So as Jo said, I think we need to hug Joanne and wish her a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jo, for this week. We also have Stan. I don't think Stan's here with us today, is he? Also, um, Naomi Kavanagh, she's one of the ch our children. Uh, Mary De Bruin, Mary's here. Happy birthday for August, Mary. Our son James is not here this morning, but it's his birthday. Elaine Wilson, Elaine, happy birthday, Elaine, for this month. Pam and John Keith, happy birthday to you both. Ben, is Ben Lowers here this morning? I thought I saw him. Ben is, oh, doing our sound. It's his birthday in August. And Nancy, your birthday in August too. Yes. Nancy, so we're going to sing happy birthday to you all. Birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday. Thanks to Ed and Jane for cake. <laughs>